All right, welcome back. I'm Rich Folley. We're at AWP 2016, this incredible writing conference, and I'm sitting here with poet, with a poet advocate as well, Edward Hirsch, um, and I am holding in my hands Gabriel, a poem, which is an, a lovely elegy to your late son, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but I just want to first welcome you to our set. Thanks. I'm glad to be with you. It's nice to have you here. We've met before. You've done um, an event for me before that moved people, and one of the things that I remember from our event Ed, is, the, uh, is your passionate advocacy for poetry and what it means in people's lives and what it can mean in people's lives. And, and there were people in the room who were actually in tears after your conversation. I'm sure this is something, as a, as a person who gives speeches and things of that sort and gives talks, that you may have seen before. But what is it about that connection that people have and the way you describe poetry that you think can move people? I mean, my argument, my feeling about poetry is that it's a kind of knowledge that you don't get elsewhere. And that many people who, who are looking for something have had poetry in their youth, then thought it wasn't for them, drifted away and came back to it, or want to come back to it, or miss seeking something. And poetry can give them a way to be in touch with themselves. And I think it's because the poems you read speak to you one-to-one -one in a way that other things don't. And so I just try and advocate for that kind of message, for that kind of communique. Um, that, because I believe that poetry delivers on our spiritual lives in a way that other kinds of information and media do not. Yeah, how so? Well, when you read a poem, you're alone with your own feelings. But you're also alone with the words of another. And I think that so it's not just your own despair or your own joy. You have those feelings. And poetry is very intimate that way. But also because it's written by someone else and because it's written in language, and language is a social medium, the poem delivers on our spiritual lives because it gives us the gift of intimacy and participation. It gives us connection to another, but it also gives us privacy. So this, I'd say, communication mystique Privacy and participation is for me at the heart of lyric exchange. You write, you, the way you talk about poetry is, uh, is, a, is a sort of on the mechanical side almost about how people process words and how it affects them. And you, and you talk about it from the inside. And you've written books about poetry, how to read poetry, and, and how to enjoy poetry, and, and the sort of breakdown of how poetry works. You're, you're attracted to both the actual sort of eloquence of the words and also how it works. I mean, I think the thing is, is William Carlos Williams says, it's difficult, get the, it's difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. It's not easy, because poems can be hard. They have forms, they have genres, it has a history, and I'm interested in all that. I think that poetry's taught the wrong way. No one's going to get interested in poetry because they're interested in iambic pentameter. But if they're interested in Shakespeare's sonnets, say, in Shakespeare's sonnets move them, then they might want to know what the rhythm of it. And that can, you know, that can articulate your appreciation. So you may not be interested in poetry because you're interested in sonnets. You're interested in what Shakespeare has to say, but the sonnet is the way of delivering it. The sonnet is the, is the, is the medium. And so it's the way the meaning enacts itself. So if you really want to understand these poems, you need to understand the sonnet too. So I try to keep in mind all the techniques, the devices, the forms, the genres, but that they work on behalf of the delivery system, of the emotional articulation, the intelligence, and the feeling that's behind the poem. So th to me, they're not separated things. But sometimes you need to separate them out to explain some of the terms, to explain some of the meanings, because these things can put people off. But you do have to work a little harder with poetry than, I mean, there's, there's a, whether it's a novel or the newspaper or a web article, um, you read it, there's a direct communication, the words are very specifically chosen to get information to you fast. With poetry, each word is crafted, thoughtful, there's an idea behind it, and you have to, it doesn't always make immediate sense, you have to think maybe twice about poetry. Well, it's true, you're right. The, in, in poetry, the way in which the thing is said is inseparable from what is being said. So you read a newspaper, if anyone still reads newspapers, you can read the story and throw the paper away. You just remember what the story, what the content was. But when you read a poem, the, 
the way in which it's said is inseparable from what is being said. The Russian poet Osip Mandelstam had a wonderful thing about this, about paraphrase. He said, if a poem can be paraphrased, then the sheets haven't been rumpled, poetry hasn't spent the night. That's nice. <laughs> You know, the way in which it's said is the, is the meaning of the poem. Yeah. So you have to articulate what that is. And you have I to think rumple the sheets. You have to rumple the sheets. And I think you can say things about it that will help people. But I think what they, people don't want is to be condescended to. They have a response to the poem. T.S. Eliot said poems communicate before they're understood. You can have a response to the poem. But, the, you know, if it's a good poem, the more you learn about it, the more it helps your articulate your appreciation and your feeling for it. Oftentimes, it's the the, the, the actual reading of a poem, hearing it out loud, I allows think that me to understand it. it faster than when I'm reading through my own. Because maybe I'm putting too much of myself into that or trying to read what you meant. But something about you speaking to me. I think that it's a bodily art. And when you hear it, it's articulated for you and it sort of washes over you. Now, there's a disadvantage to that, which is you hear it and you have an effect but you can't stop, you can't pause, you can't think about it. So in a poem, Sappho, first great Greek lyric poet, coins a word. She takes the word bitter and she takes the word sweet and she puts it together to a word called bittersweet, which she makes up, which is a concept we all understand. And she calls it Eros the bittersweet. She names something that no one had named before, which is the bittersweetness of erotic love. Now, when you're hearing that, I mean, I don't know, I wasn't in Greece, but it seems to me it would be hard to think about that because you're just hearing the poem. You'd be struck by it. But when you read it, you can see that she's put these things together and that gives you time. So here, there's something to be said for hearing it aloud and having that first dramatic experience. But there's also something to be said for reading it and seeing how it's put together because then you can stop. Oral poetry doesn't allow you to stop. If you stop, you get lost. Right. You can't follow the story. But when you stop, when you read, you can pause or you can reread. And I think that's how poetry helps deliver its message. So you've been, uh, your, your career in poetry is long and varied and you've done a lot of different things. When do you, do you remember when poetry first struck you? Do you have a moment or do you have a time in your life when poetry became important to you? I have, I mean, in How to Read a Poem and Fall in Love with Poetry, I write about three initiations in my life. And so yes, I have very many moments. I didn't start writing poetry seriously till the end of high school and then in college I decided I had a vocation. But before that, I had some experiences. And maybe the one I'll tell you about is when I was eight years old, my grandfather died and I was extremely close to him. I adored him. And I knew that he had written poetry. I didn't know anything about it. But I remembered that he would write poems. And I was desolate and I went down to the basement of my family, of our house, and they had anthologies and there were some books. And in those days they had anthologies, they didn't have the names of the poets on the anthologies. And I opened a poem and I read a poem and for some reason I decided my grandfather had written it. It was called Spellbound. It didn't have the name of the poet on it. And it was tremendously moving to me and I felt that my grandfather was sending me a message. Now when I was in high school, I had an anthology of poetry in English class, and I was turning it around, and I go, hey, this poet writes so much like my grandfather. Hold it a second. <laughs> I found it again. It's Emily Bronte. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I, I was right about the your, meaning, but I was wrong was about- was hanging with some great company there. <laughs> totally wrong about the author. So I had a few experiences that were meaningful to me, but when I was in high school, I started writing poetry out of emotional need. And when I was in college, I began to read it. And when I began to read it and to imitate what I was reading, that's when I started to actually become a poet. The oldest word for poetry in Greek is poesis, which means making. A poet is a maker and a poem is a made thing. When I was just writing out of my own feelings, I was writing down my feelings, but I wasn't really writing poetry. But when I tried to shape my feelings into something, when I tried to make something, although I couldn't have articulated that, I was actually starting on my path towards actually becoming a poet rather than a person who was writing down lines. In Gabriel, uh, this beautiful poem in my hand, um, you took a really difficult time in your life, the loss of your son, Gabriel, and did that. You did just what you said. Sort of, it wasn't just writing down your experiences, but you wrote something that feels universal for people who understand grief, who understand loss. Um, it's a very personal experience, but you wrote something that appeals across your own personal experience. 
Well, thank you for saying so. I mean, I had to make a decision about whether I would try to make a poem. Because when you're making a poem, you are also engaged in the making of art. And I was cannibalizing my own life and Gabriel's life too, to make this book. But I was so despairing. I was so desolate really as a person and as a father that I felt I needed to do something. And writing the poem gave me a way to try and articulate and think about my grief. And it was a relief not just to be grieving, but to be trying to turn it into something. And it actually sort of comforted me to try and do it. So, and I decided to do that, I had to be pretty honest and as forthright as one could possibly be because you can't be sentimental when you're writing a poem. So anyway, I decided to go all out and that I could do it and I tried and I've been gratified that the book has found people who have suffered tremendous losses. I, I didn't write it for that reason exactly, but it's been very meaningful to me that other people who've lost loved ones, especially children, but other people too, who've suffered, have found some comfort in my, in my book. That's meant a lot to me. Well, it's a, it's a beautiful book, and you're uh, such an amazing spokesperson for the power of words and poetry to heal, but also to excite and make people understand the world better and I hope that you continue to go out and spread that well, word. We need well, more of that. And uh, it's so wonderful to have it's you really here. It's really a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very Edward much. Edward Hirsch, thanks for being with us. Thanks.